Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining the call. My name is Jonah Furman. I'm with Labor Notes. We're here tonight to talk about some of the biggest fights coming up in the labor movement, uh, specifically in the private sector this year and next, some of the biggest union fights. Uh, and we're excited to be joined by some of these speakers. First, I just wanted to say a couple words on you know, what Labor Notes is and why we're putting on an event like this. Um, so Labor Notes is a media and organizing project. It's been around since 1979. Uh, you know, we publish stories on the labor movement from the bottom up, and we also organize with union members who are trying to, as we call it, put the movement back in the labor movement. Um, so we bring people together from teachers, grocery workers, auto workers, teamsters, everyone who's organizing for a stronger union and more power on the job. Um, I just wanted to plug next week, we have an event on running for local union office. You can check out our website at labornotes.org. Um, we have events on a uh, weekly or monthly basis. So why we're having this call tonight with these speakers, um, just to frame it a little bit, it's been a chaotic couple years for people who work for a living in the U.S., um, especially in the private sector. We've seen you know, the essential worker go from hero to zero. We've seen strikes. We've seen uh, some new organizing. It's been a crazy time for everybody who works for a living uh, in the pandemic. And, you know, we know some of these issues were here before and have just been made much worse. One of the things we focus on at Labor Notes is the tools we need to fight back. And a lot of these tools are found in our unions, uh, whether it's through contract campaigns, strikes, or just being organized. The question of whether the unions will use their power to fight back against the, the chaos, against you know health and safety issues, against wages, against inflation, against um, you know corporate profits, this is the big question. And whether union members can sort of put their, their uh, organization and their tools to the test. So tonight we're joined by union members from some of the biggest fights in the private sector. We have grocery workers, we have Teamsters, we have auto workers. Um, and I'll just give a brief introduction of who will be joined uh, by on the call. If you have any questions, you can, of course, put those in the, in the YouTube chat and we will try and take some of those near the end if we're able to. So uh, we are joined by Kyung Berry from the United Food and Commercial Workers Local 21, a rank and file grocery worker in Washington state and a member of the executive board of Local 21 and of the bargaining committee. Mike Cannon, who's a retired United Auto Workers UAW international representative and a steering committee of UAWD, a movement within the UAW that fought for the right to vote on top union officers, which they just won, and is now pushing for a more democratic and fighting union ahead of the big three auto makers contract negotiations next year. We have Dave Burnt, a UPS Teamster out of Chicago and a co-chair of the Teamsters for a Democratic Union, a rank and file group in the Teamsters Union that's been around since the 70s and recently helped elect new leadership of that union and is gearing up for the massive UPS contract that also expires next summer. Um, and finally, we have Kevin Lowry, a 20 year grocery worker at King Supers in Littleton, Colorado with UFCW Local 7, who is currently part of the biggest strike in the country where over 8,000 workers are on strike against the Kroger owned King Supers. So to start us off, uh, Kevin is calling in from his car by the picket line. And I just thought it would be great to hear a little bit about the most active fight on this call right now, the biggest strike in the country. Um, Kevin, if you could just tell us about what this strike is about, what it's been like on the picket line, um, what's it been like organizing up to it in the past, you know, two years? Well, so right now we're on, on an unfair labor practice strike. Um, over the last few months, Kroger blatantly violated our contract by hiring subcontractors to do union member work, um, by failing to provide information as we're also in bargaining for a new new cba agreement with kroger they haven't provided the union with all the information we need to bargain a fair and equitable contract um and so we're in the middle of the contract fight and it's spilled over to the media and as of yesterday we had a temporary injunction in, imposed on the picketers 
limiting the, the access that we can have on the picket line in terms of how many members I can have on what they consider store property and limiting how we engage with our customers to explain our fight. Um, the community support has been overwhelmingly positive and we have cleared out these parking lots out here in Colorado with Kit Kroger. Um, so we're taking the fight to them. The workers are mad. The workers are upset. They want, they want a fair living contract that treats them with dignity and respect for the last two years workers all over the country but here in colorado have dealt with covid not being notified when we've been exposed to positive cases of co-workers in the store kroger's never paid for any testing for any employees um i know my store half my store was out on covid right before we came out on the picket line i still have members returning from covid isolation and Kroger didn't tell any other coworkers that, hey, half our store is out with COVID. And so we're just fighting to be treated with respect, to be pr protected on the job, and to be treated with dignity and paid a living wage. Yeah, say a little bit more about that, Kevin. I know there's been this issue of Kroger saying it's a $4.50 raise, and if you do the math, it's like a $0.25 cent raise for a lot of these members and also in grocery in general just the idea of this you know a lot of these jobs used to be good lifelong well-paid jobs and it's really gone down tell us a little bit more about that well and even with kroger's wage offer that's on the table um which is decent but their health care offer wouldn't fully fund our health care so our health care would run out of funding uh by our projection would be sometime probably next year which would mean the members end up getting a cut in benefits or a raise in their out-of-pocket expenses. And the numbers we've seen could be up to $75 a week in an increase. Uh -huh. And that would more than wipe out whatever wages they have on the tables. Right. And can you just say, I know you got to go soon, Kevin, but if you could just tell us a little bit about what's it been like building up to this. I mean, you and I were talking about going store to store, talking to people about safety on the job. You know, what does it look like to build? You don't just snap your fingers and have an 8,000 person strike. No, it's about having those personal conversations with, with, with the workers and asking them what, what affects you and what you want to fight for and explaining, you know, why the substandard treatment of Kroger is not acceptable and shouldn't be acceptable to the workers. We go into, we should not have to worry about leaving the store the same way we walked into it at the beginning of our shift. You know, we had the mass shooting out here in Boulder last year. Um, and Kroger has been very, they haven't done anything really to improve security measures outside of takeaway time delay, um, sensors on their emergency exits that would block those doors for 18 seconds after activated until people could get out. UFCW Local 7 was pushing for three years starting in 2018 to get those alarms off those doors. And unfortunately, it took 10 dead bodies in one of Kroger's stores for him to finally react. Wow. Chung, maybe you could tell us a little bit more. I mean, you know, one of the interesting things about Kroger, there was this big survey that came out that was, you know, said two thirds of workers in the past year have faced food insecurity, something like 15 percent experienced homelessness. Uh, and Kroger is a huge company. It's something like the fourth largest private employer in the country, has 450,000 uh, employees. There's also Albertsons, other big grocery employers. So it's not like, you know, just a forgotten part of the economy. It's our food, you know, it's our food supply chain. So maybe, Kyung, uh, could you talk about, like, is this everywhere? Is this facing members in Washington State and others you've talked to? Oh, you're muted, Kyung. Sorry, you're on mute. Sorry. Yeah, there you go. For, for decades and decades, they have not kept up. The grocery industry has not kept up with the cost of living for their workers. Uh, the safety has been a major issue for years and years. We've, we've talked to them. We've tried to negotiate uh, safety issues. So... I'm dealing with my members who are struggling to pay rent, um, even on, um, you know, if you've been there, I've been there 20 years. Uh, 
it's a struggle. Do you buy food one week or do you buy a prescription? Do you buy um, the meat that has gone up so much lately? Um, you have to pick and choose. Um, I'm lucky. I'm guaranteed 40 hours a week, but there are a lot of workers who are not. And when they're working part time, it, it's a real struggle. And we, we feel we have helped make these companies so profitable. They've been very profitable for decades and decades. And all of a sudden, COVID hits and they're even more profitable. More people are shopping at grocery stores and they're not going to restaurants for about a, almost a year. The, those restaurants were closed. They were not allowed to do any um, go to restaurants. So they're going to the grocery store and it's become like a habit. You guys eat like a family. You have a meal. You talk about what's going on. So it's gotten some families closer together. But grocery workers, we're at work. <laughs> we're serving our community, making sure they get the uh, food that they need. And we feel we're not being respected uh, by some of these wage uh, increases they're, they're talking about. We have not started bargaining in Western Washington. Uh, we're getting ready to, our contract expires in May. I know California expires in March and Colorado already expired. And so uh, the West Coast UFCWs have worked closely in the last couple of years together. And we're going to keep on working together and solidarity because if we don't fight together on these issues, that affects hundreds and hundreds of thousands of workers, no one will. So we, the workers, have to stand together and and be there for each other and tell our stories. Um, I think one of the main things that people don't understand is the mental stress. This has caused a lot of workers in any industry that's working right now. Um, customers are, it's like, some, for some of them, it's like a party. They, they don't have to go to work. They, they can stay home and be safe while we are constantly having customers come in the store. There's no counting numbers anymore of how many customers are in the store. They did that for about, I think it was like three months. And then after that, it was done. And so we're constantly having to deal with people that are literally less than a foot from us because they need help or they need help with the self-checkout. So we're being exposed to a lot of things that we don't want to be exposed to right now. And it's affecting our mental um, health. It really is. Yeah. That's a big issue. And so our, you know, UFCW uh, West Coast, our, our message to everyone is we want respect. We want to be protected. And we want to be compensated for the money that they're making, that they're pocketing and giving CEOs huge bonuses, giving the upper management huge bonuses while we're, we're the ones taking most of the risk. Yeah. And so right now with the mask, we can't even get masks. Uh, we're lucky if we can get the three ply mask, we can't even get the N95 mask. So you know, it's kind of a shame that these companies have profited so much and they're just, just, I know they're laughing to the bank, you know, all the money they're getting while we, the workers are kind of in a way isolated and, and we've in some ways the workers feel kind of alone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Uh, Kevin, I, I'm conscious of the time. I know you, you had a picket line needs to need to get back to it. Um, Chong said, you know, the importance of sharing worker stories. Is there anything else you want to share from the picket line that you've heard from your coworkers or or anything you'd, you'd like to share before you hop off? Uh, the one last thing would be is I just want Kroger to do the right thing. I am tired of hearing stories about my coworkers living in their cars. We need a living wage, we need to be protected, and we need to be respected. Um, and to all my grocery workers and all you essential workers out there, 
you all mean something and we're all a part of a big movement taking fights to these corporations and educating each other and looking out for each other yeah well thanks kevin thanks for taking some time off to uh talk to us thank you i've got to get back to my picket line but thank you for the invite i really appreciate it of course thanks for joining um solidarity uh Mike and Dave, I kind of wanted to hear, you know, one of the things I wanted to for us to all talk about was, uh, and Kyung kind of talked about this, like the issues that were before the pandemic and how they've been made worse um, by the pandemic, whether it's like the wage issue with, with CEO pay going so far out of whack with what the average worker is getting, whether it's safety on the job. You know, one of the things that stands out to me talking to grocery workers is like, there's a lot of people who are stuck at the bottom of a wage scale and don't really have a pathway to getting to a living wage. And we think of sort of, you know, Teamster jobs and UAW jobs as really strong contracts, but increasingly there's two tier or multiple tiers in the UAW. There's part-timers making, you know, either not getting enough hours or not getting enough wages or both. Um, so I'm just curious, you know, Mike or Dave, you want to share what are workers facing in the UAW and in the Teamsters um, and how, if at all, has that changed in the pandemic? Well, I, I can go first. Uh, the, the UAW members that I talk to are uh, extremely concerned about the working conditions and the, and the compensation. Um, we have uh, temporary workers who, like you said, are not getting enough hours, uh, no doubt about it. And uh, we made some, some small gains in the last contract to try to close the gap between the tiers, but we keep adding more people on to those, those at the bottom of it. So, you know, workers are still fighting to get up to the top pay. I just talked to a GM worker earlier today who told me that uh, he's been working for the company now for eight years and he's still not at top pay. Uh, you know, so that's going to be an issue, no doubt, in the negotiations and 2023 with the big three. Again, workers are not going to give up. They're going to continue to come back and say, look, we've got to get this corrected so that everybody's making the same wage rate for the jobs that we're performing. This is ridiculous. Um, and so it's going to be a real big issue, it's going to be a contentious issue uh, in the upcoming negotiations next year. You know, we go into big three bargaining in July of uh, 2023. So we got a year and a half to uh, to get ready for it. Uh, but you can bet your bottom dollar. We saw the same uh, struggle in the Deer Corporation strike, if you remember last fall. Uh, they, they they were valiant in their efforts to to get rid of the tears and, and also share in the profit that these corporations are making. They're making huge profits. So that's, uh, that's going to be, like I said, a very big issue in the next negotiations. The whole tier wage and benefits as well. Right. So, yes. Yeah, Dave, you want to talk about UPS a little bit? <clears throat> yeah, sure. And, and um, uh, you know, most of uh, the vast majority of our members, uh, the Teamsters Union, you know, were designated essential workers and were workers that, you know, continued to work and have never stopped working since the pandemic began. And as I say, I'll mention we we do represent over 100,000 workers in the in the grocery and food service industries, including at Groger and Albertsons um, and Costco and other big grocery chains. So, um, you know, we represent the warehouse and drivers um, and have been dealing with those members have been dealing with a lot of the same issues that um, the brother and sister from UFCW mentioned. Um, but, you know, specifically in UPS, where I work, um, and, and I think this is something that's happened in a lot of our industries, um, they, you know, during the course of the pandemic, um, the volume of UPS has gone through the roof, like in the grocery industry, um, you know, changing, changing consumer patterns have, uh, have just created a huge balloon in the volume that UPS, uh, ha handles. So from the standpoint of corporate profits, it's been very profitable for UPS. Um, the volume's been there. Um, but at the same time, you know, in order in order to get that volume uh, processed and get those packages delivered, 
um, there's been huge cases of excessive overtime. So um, <clears throat> one of the biggest issues that are facing um, UPS members and there were package car drivers who, you know, deliver the package, the people you see every day that go to your house and deliver your packages um, is the issue of forced overtime and force work on a sixth day. Um, UPS rolled out Saturday deliveries a few years back. Um, and during the course of the pandemic, like I said, the volume went up so much and they just simply did not have um, did not have the labor power, did not have enough workers to do it. So not in every part of the country. I'm fortunate in our local, we, we don't have that. Um, we have language against that. But in much of the country, there are drivers that are, um, for the past year or two, have been working six days a week, um, doing a very physical job, and it's taken a big toll on them. And uh, similarly, in, in our hubs, uh, and well, I should mention with the package car, we've also dealt with the issue from our last contract that was negotiated by the outgoing administration. Uh, the package, um, like the issues that UAW is having, they've created a second tier of workforce um, that don't that have that are paid at a lower scale and have less rights in regards to uh, language that deals with excessive overtime. So that's gonna be one of our biggest issues going into contract negotiations. Um, the other thing I'll mention in terms of UPS um, is in among our part-time ranks and one, uh, the, ma the majority of members, UPS members in the Teamsters Union at UPS are part-time workers that work in the warehouse and the hubs that load and unload trailers, um, you know, sort packages and so on. Um, most of them are part time, and the pay scales for for newly new newly hired part timers are we consider very low. It's at about fifteen dollars an hour now, uh, is what's written in the contract, and that's one of the issues that we campaigned against when we called for a no vote for the contract, the previous contract. Um, the labor shortage has created a situation where actually in lots of areas of the country, uh, UPS is paying above the minimum required wage of the contract. So we have areas of the country that are bringing in part-timers at 20, 24 bucks an hour uh, because of the difficulties in hiring people to, you know, all, yeah. that all companies are, are, are dealing with. You're talking about very physical jobs. Um, you know, uh, often they're in, you know, not easy to get to areas of, of, uh, of the city. Um, so that's an issue that we've dealt with um, across the country where they're actually exceeding the contract. Um, however, they can take that at any, away at any time. And they and um, in fact, they're starting to do that in many parts of the country. Um, so that'll be another big issue that we take into negotiations. Uh, the last thing I'll mention is uh, the issue of hazard pay. Many of the companies, uh, so that's another thing that that uh, we need to fix. So, you know, there's, I'll stop there. There was, of course, a lot of other stuff. Uh, but reasons I wanted to have this group, especially you three, is that we're sort of looking at issues that have been facing everyone who works, right? Like Walmart workers face a lot of these things. Non-union workers face a lot of these things. And the difference, the reason, you know, I uh, follow union stuff so closely is that's the tool to, to do something about it. It's not like, the, like people are happy at non-union companies. They just don't have a mechanism by which to have something like a contract campaign. And the two things that are interesting to me about this particular group is that we're talking about, you know, Kyung, you're in this coalition of 100,000 grocery workers who are sort of, you know, bargaining together. Dave, you're talking about 250,000, 300,000 UPS workers. Mike, just the big three alone in the UAW is, what, 150,000? Maybe we're at 100, 150,000 auto workers, not to mention, you know, other folks in, who will be affected by better conditions at UPS for better conditions in, at Kroger. Um, so, and, and Dave, you kind of mentioned this about the, the Vote No campaign that happened in 2018, but I kind of wanted to talk about contract campaigns. The second reason I'm interested in this group is 
we have kind of the stages of a contract campaign. Kyung, you're like in the thick of it with the first local already on strike and your local is seriously looking at, you know, a, an expiring contract. Dave, you're kind of finally have this tool of a new leadership that is committed to a real campaign. And with the Martin Luther King Day action, I feel like it's sort of soft, you know, sort of launching. And Mike, you're in this situation where the UAW has not been known for its contract campaigns at the big three, but this is sort of on the table with the, the fights happening. So I want to just talk about what's it like to run a contract campaign. Kyung, I don't know if you want to start. What's it been like talking, just going to store to store, talking to members? How do regular members get involved in this stuff? How do you build something strong? What's it like to try and build that kind of thing? And you're muted, Kyung, sorry. <laughs> So this will be my, uh, what is it, sixth contract uh, negotiation. And basically, like with this year, what we have started last year is having members sign a pledge that if things do not go the way we want, we will uh, resort, last resort is to, you know, go on strike. But the... It's to get the members to know what the issues are because we do have like a very big turnover uh, in the grocery industry. You're looking at like some some instances, 50 percent turnovers. We have a lot of young people that go to college and then they go out of the industry. So um, we're dealing with this reeducating every three years and to t- tell the members what we're fighting for, what we're for what we want uh, besides livable wage, which we have, every union member is fighting for. Uh, safety now, especially now with what's going on. And it's interesting when you go talk to people from other stores, the stories are very similar. We're all dealing with the same issues. Uh, not having enough money to pay mortgage or rent being lucky to have a mortgage. Uh, Most of my coworkers are renters. And to hear that their rents are going up three, four hundred dollars, it's it's just crazy how we as a society can make that happen. You know, we should be appalled at a rental company or some kind of uh, conglomerate who will raise someone's rent that high is appalling. And we in the United States need to say enough is enough. I mean, you guys are making plenty of money. These apartment buildings that I live close by, there are hundreds of them. Each of them are going to go up a couple of hundred dollars. That's ridiculous. And, you know, it's kind of sad when you go and talk to people in the grocery industry who've been there 20, 30 years. They've gotten like... I want to say, when I was a journeyman in 2004, uh, it was like let little, and right now with the worker shortage, I do the hiring at my store and I talk to a lot of people who are hiring. They can't find people to work. People are not coming in to be in our industry because they feel unsafe. That You know, the hours... Right. And bringing all these new people into the campaign, I mean, that's really interesting to me is like, how do you deal with that sort of turnover if you're, especially if there's sort of one group of the union, as I know there is in grocery or in UPS, who sort of turns over really fast and now it's time to build strength for a contract. And how do you bring those people in? I don't know, Dave, if you have thoughts on, you know, organizing part-timers at UPS on that front into a contract campaign. Sure. And um, you know, as, as you mentioned, Jonah, so we, you know, as part of a, a, you know, help campaign and help elect a new slate that was elected last November, uh, takes office in March, um, that'll be running the, the union, uh, the international union, um, uh, for a five-year term. And one of the biggest issues and one of the ways that the coalition that, that formed that was ultimately victorious um, one of the biggest issues was the lack of serious contract campaigns and 
um, the willingness to apply serious pressure on employers, particularly our large, you know, national contracts. Um, you know, there's others, but UPS is the biggest one. And a lot of the sort of momentum around our campaign um, started with the last two UPS contracts that contained significant concessions. I mentioned a few of them. There's others. Um, th there were issues over health care. There were issues over pensions. There were issues over, you know, this two tier I mentioned and, and, and much more. Um, and what happened in the course of those uh, uh, contracts you know, there was no real contract campaigns in those in those contracts. You know, the the union just went to negotiations, said very little about what was going on, shared very little bit with the members, didn't mobilize them in any way um, and just went to the employers and and got something negotiated. You know, they didn't want to rock the boat, you know. Um, so there was a lot of anger around those contracts. And so what we did um, in Teamsters for a Democratic Union, the rank and file caucus, is we started to organize that anger and organize the rank and file members that wanted to do something. And so we campaigned for a no vote um, on, on both of those contracts. And we had success um, in some of the supplements in 2013. And in 2018, we actually voted the whole contract down nationally. Um, so ultimately that contract got imposed. Um, however, the the sort of constituency, organized constituency was built um, that allowed for the victory, the significant victory we had this year or last late last year, um, where we won basically two to one. Um, and so going forward, as we look into, you know, OK, what what do we want the incoming administration to do? Um, what we want to do is continue. I mean, we as as TDU and other you know rank and filers and uh, folks that that are on the ground and looking towards the next negotiation is to continue that organization. And we'll have a leadership in, uh, in Washington, uh, IBT leadership. Uh, that wants to utilize that. And so in order to bring people in, you have to start organizing them and you have to go out there and you have to talk to them. Right. Um, so, you know, what we need to do and, you know, what we're going to be advocating for is to have constant, uh, you know, activities at workplaces, pre-work uh, rallies, um, lots of information coming out, uh, contract surveys, um, and making uh, sort of a public uh, a, a, a public display to the company that our members are ready and they're ready to fight. Um, and only in that way can we really push UPS uh, to make uh, the kind of improvements in the contract that we're going to advocate for. So, you know, as, as it exists, because of all of the defeats, all of the concessions that, that members have, have gone through, there's a problem of disengagement, right? A lot of members don't believe in the union anymore. They don't think anything good can happen. So they haven't felt, you know, it's no, it's no mystery why less, not a lot of members go to meetings and why a lot of members don't vote and so on. It's because they don't think that participation in the union can improve their lives. So we need to go out there and start having the conversation with them, start having public displays, start talking about their issues in an organized fashion um, so that they will get engaged and say, hey, look, this is something that can actually change my life. This is something that can actually give me an increase in wages, get rid of the two tier, whatever the issue may be. Um, but it starts with having an organized base. And, um, you know, the importance of this election is now we have a leadership in Washington that believes that that is the way uh, to negotiate a contract. UPS isn't going to give it to us just because, you know, we go and ask them and ask nicely. They're going to give it to us when they see that there is a real incredible strike threat. Um, so, you know, those are, you know, there's a lot more, again, to say about that kind of thing. But I think that's, you know, that that is the, uh, you know, that is the way forward in terms of getting improvements from these companies. And, you know, these companies are, your Kroger's, your Albertsons, your your big three, your you know your UPS, 
they're doing quite well. They've made a lot of money during the course of this pandemic. Um, and um, <clears throat> I think there are a lot of opportunities going forward where if we have these kind of real contract campaigns, we can win improvements and turn around, turn around the labor movement. Yeah. I, you know, Mike, it makes me think like you have a lot of history with this stuff. You were an international rep from the UAW for what, 23 years, something like that. Like what has it been like in the big three, especially such an iconic, you know, a lot of people, when they think of the labor movement, they think of auto workers. Um, and there's been a lot of activity in the, you know, among the membership in, in groups like UAWD for decades. Um, but what have contract campaigns look like at uh, the big three or other big employers in the UAW? And what, what do you think they should be like? You're muted, Mike. Sorry. The fact of the matter is, is that in the UAW, we don't use the whole contract campaign method of approaching negotiations. Uh, we're sort of like we're sort of like in the same book that the Teamsters have been for all these years as well. Um, and uh, a contract campaign is really the heart and soul of a successful negotiations. There's no doubt about it. Once you engage those members into the process, you show them that they not only have input, but they also have direction. They're going to they're going to develop the issues for you. Then they have a vested interest on the outcome of it as well. Right. So they become engaged in that scenario. And for whatever reasons, the UAW has used the old method of negotiating. That is basically go in the back room and work out some kind of agreement and then come to the workers and say, here's your contract. We saw that in the deer negotiations that occurred last week, last year. Um, and that's exactly what they did. They went in and negotiated with the, with the company, some agreement that they thought the workers wanted, and then they presented it, it was resoundingly rejected. Um, and then they go back and negotiate with the company again and bring up another uh, contract proposal, and the workers turn that down for the second time. And after the second rejection, there was, one UAW negotiator was asked, well, what are you going to do now? And he says, well, we're going to go back and talk to the workers. Like, what? What? You know, now you're going to talk to the workers? Why do you talk to the workers when you started preparing for negotiations so that you, you were able to uncover the issues that were important to the workers, the ones who had to vote on the contract and had to live under that contract? Uh, so... UAWD is hoping to change that at some point. We're trying to move in the same direction that TDU and the teachers have moved in, in terms of getting different leadership in the UAW that will embrace uh, uh, contract campaigns as a, as a routine method to uh, negotiate contracts for the auto workers. Uh, because we, we have the same problems that Dave has in the teachers. And that is, we've got workers who are just, they've checked out. Uh, they're apathetic. Uh, they don't believe that the system works for them. So they don't get involved and they just try to go about their business uh, and they just, you know, throw the UAW out of their mind altogether. So um, and in the deer situation, just to give you an example, UAWD uh, put up a GoFundMe page for the deer workers. Right. And our initial goal was to raise just $10,000 to help the strikers while they were out on strike. And we raised $10,000 in a matter of a few hours. Uh, all told, we raised $180,000 for the deer strikers. And we were able to use that money to give the deer strikers, you know, $50 a week, they could go into the grocery store and buy groceries. So that's part of you know, contract campaign, making sure that you aid workers when they're out on strike. Uh, in the UAW right now, it's policy that if any money is raised for strikers, it has to go to the international union. It doesn't go directly to the strikers. So that's another thing that we have to change as well when we get into this whole contract campaign mode that we hope to institute in the UAW. But first, we have to be like Dave and, and TDU and the Teamsters and start electing uh, leaders that are going to embrace this concept and use it on, on, a, on, a, on a routine basis. Now, our elections for the International Executive Board are going to occur later this year. We've got a convention coming up in July, 
And then we're going to have elections at some point after that. The dates and times have not been set yet because the monitor is still working on the rules. But uh, for any union that's attempting to, to fulfill this obligation to truly represent workers, you have to engage in the whole contract campaign concept. You have to do that. That's the only way. Because you also can involve the community as well and use community pressure on the company to help uh, arrive at a, at a contract that's acceptable to workers. So we're, we've got a lot of work to do in the UAW and UAWD is is working in is moving in that direction um, and we're trying to play catch up with you know what's going on with the teamsters but uh, but we're committed to do that because that is certainly the lifeline not only for the uh, the future of the workers involved here but also we have to maintain the UAW the union as an institution so we continue to make gains you know for decades to come thank you yeah Thanks, Mike. Yeah, Kyung, go ahead. Uh, you're muted right now. Sorry. Hey, uh, I think you're still muted. Try one more time. There you go. Okay. Good now. Okay. Sorry. So UFCW 21 has been um, actually we've been dealing with um, talking to members uh, on our negotiation committee it's all members and um, leadership uh, Dave Smith's uh, original president uh, he started this uh, concept which sometimes international uh, needs to catch up I think in that concept we're having union members at the table discussing what the issues are. And uh, 2013, we were 72 hours away from a strike because um, the company would not negotiate saving the meat pension. And we were all in, grocery retail clerks were all in and saying, we need to make sure those members and retirees have a pension. And it, we do surveys before we go do a contract is up so we know what the members are top priorities are and we are constantly going into stores talking to members along with leadership so we we have a good understanding why what we need to fight for and what are the you know the top issues cuz if you don't go to the workers who do the job you're not going to understand what you need for those uh, contracts. So we've been very, very lucky that we have leaderships that's forward thinking and thinking outside the box. And we've been doing it for quite a while and have uh, had major, really good contract um, campaigns. But anytime uh, a leadership is asked, hey, what's going on? Our leaders will say, let's talk to a member. Let's do, uh, you know, go to the source. So I feel very lucky that we've uh, ha been running it that way in uh, my local for over decades. Yeah, Kyung, that's a really interesting point. I mean, I think we talk about, you know, at Labor Notes, we talk about union democracy as this idea that members should have control of their own union and have a say in things that are important. But I feel like, you know, everyone on this call it is an interesting idea to sort of explore, like, why does it matter to bring in working members into these fights? Like, if your lo local president or your union president could just have a backroom deal that had decent wages and decent conditions, you know, talking to you three, I get the sense that, like, there would still be something missing there. Um, and I'm just curious, sort of, maybe if you have a story of someone, or maybe it's you who was brought into the fight, you know, one of the things that's interesting to me about talking to people who are in big contract campaigns is not just that UPS is economically important or the grocery industry is economically important. It is, but it's also exciting to me to think about, you know, 500,000 people going through a strike or a real campaign or having some sort of experience that has sort of flipped that switch in their head. So I don't know if you have you know, experience of this of rank and file members in your union, or if it's your story of how you got activated in the union, but just this idea of like, 
regular working people having a role in this stuff and it's not just something that happens in an office building somewhere. I'm just curious if you if that sparks anything. Well, I know a lot of our um, members who got more involved. It had to do with an issue, a certain issue that they were dealing with, uh, either cut in hours, seniority was not being uh, applied at, at their location. Uh, th there was, uh, their pay was not correct. Things like that that affect them uh, on their bottom line. That's what gets people involved and figure out what, why is it not fixed and who can I go to to get that fixed. So a lot of these fights are things that they've dealt with personally. And when you help that person resolve a problem, uh, they get more activated and they have more interest in um, the union. And, and I always tell people the union is you and me. You know, just like government, you and me are the government because we elect these people. Same with the union. And if you don't like something, you you be the change. You go out there and fight for what your coworkers need. And, um, you know, that's the best way to do it. If you don't live the life, you can't fight for it. Mike or Dave, anything else here? Well, I, I mean, I would just say that um, uh, I suppose you could kind of do a mental exercise and say, yeah, if, if um, you know, if, if those backroom deals were effective, maybe it wouldn't, you know, <laughs> maybe we wouldn't have to do all this shit, you know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, the reality is, you know, just a sort of basic labor concept that our power comes from, you know, our collective strength, right? Um, <clears throat> their power comes from the fact that they own the damn company. Our power comes from the fact that we do all the work that creates the profits for the company. So it's our ability, um, you know, it's our ability to, to act collectively um, obviously, the biggest tool we have is the strike. Um, but even beyond, you know, just on a sort of day to day level, um, <clears throat> the reality is um, when you have member disengagement, um, enforcement of the contract, protection of the members just falls apart um, because even the best and most talented and best intention local president or international president or officer of some level um, cannot handle all of the day-to-day -day, um, activity of the union. You need folks on the ground that are working every day that are the eyes and ears of the union um, to be there to enforce the contract, right? So one of the, like the biggest issues that we deal with in the hub, um, you know, in the warehouses is the issue of supervisors working, you know, the company, constantly understaffs um, and tries to do our, you know, and the supervisor sort of pick up the slack and, and do our bargaining unit work. Um, so we have language in the contract that says they can't do it under any condition. We have penalties in, involved in that. Um, and where we've been effective at, at, at stopping it, or at least, um, you know, it, at least reducing it, um, making it difficult for them is when we have members there, you know, to see the supervisors working, right? So that's just one example, right? Um, that we need folks that are engaged in order to do the work we, we can, you know, it's not like a luxury. It's sort of the basis of everything we do is that we need members out there that are educated, informed, willing to stand up and fight. Um, and everything from day-to-day -day struggles to um, collecting, you know, negotiating our contracts where um, the real pressure we have, the only reason, you know, the, the only reason they sit down with us, right? <laughs> the only reason we bargain with, they bargain with us is because we have the ability to strike. Um, and that's what it really comes down to. So to the extent that they see that as a realistic threat or not is what determines what we can get from them. Totally. Yeah, go ahead. 
Let me, let me just add something here on this question. You know, the greatest resource that you have when you enter uh, contract negotiations is the wisdom of the, the collective wisdom of the membership. I mean, it's their, it's their plight. You know, they're the ones who are going to have to, to, to either gain or lose depending on the outcome of that situation. So union leaders don't have all the answers simply because they have this title, right? I used, I used to tell the story, which now it's 40 years ago, we were in a concessionary bargaining situation in Moog in St. Louis in, uh, in 1982, and the company in the last sort of gas to, uh, to, uh, to intimidate the workers and force us back to work um, or to accept their contract, they fired a bunch of workers. And we had a meeting with the membership. We go, oh my gosh, we have these folks are fired. What are we going to do? One guy just jumps up in the meeting and says, we're going to take up a collection for these folks, right? And so we took up a collection at the meeting and then we decided, hey, let's make this an organizing tool to keep everybody involved in the struggle, right? So we went around every week. We had people assigned in every department and shift and they would go around on every Friday and every Monday and collect more money for these workers who were discharged, right, unjustly by the company in an attempt to intimidate us, right? And so we used that money to support those workers. We bought them food, we paid rent, we paid car insurance, whatever they need, light gas, whatever. We paid it out of that, what we call the solidarity fund, right? Um, and so we were able to support those workers until we got their jobs back with full back pay and seniority when we got the contract resolved. But this became another organizing tool that we used to keep people together. So once you use the contract campaign concept and use that approach, you'll be amazed at what comes out of it because you're tapping into the collective wisdom of this great body of people who are committed to make this thing a success. And there's no greater power than that, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, I, so there's been a couple of people putting uh, questions, I think, in the YouTube uh, comments, and can't take all of them. But I did want to pick up a couple that were talking about sort of the local union. We're talking about these national contracts or regional campaigns, hundreds of thousands of workers, which is exciting. And of course, you need to get to that scale. But most people are, you know, in their workplace, if they're, you know, unionized, they have their local union. On the level of the local union,